All right, good morning. Welcome to an oral argument session here at the 5th District. As the marshal indicated, I am Judge Harris. I'm joined on the panel this morning by Judge Saud. <coughs> oh, gosh, excuse me, and Judge Pratt. We've got three cases on the docket today. Um, at, at this time, if you uh, could take a moment to make sure any cell phones or other noise-making devices are either turned off or silenced so that the proceedings are not interrupted. And keep in mind that these proceedings are being recorded uh, and live streamed on YouTube. Each side's got 20 minutes for the argument. Appellate can reserve as much of that as they would like for rebuttal. Our default is five minutes. If you'd like anything other than that, please let me know. So the first case on our docket today is case 23-243, Amy Taylor versus State Farm. Counsel for Appellant, when you are ready, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, my name is Chris Hall. I represent uh, Plaintiff Taylor. Um, this, uh, in this case, uh, Plaintiff seeks- Five minutes for rebuttal, Mr. Five Hall. Five minutes, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, in this case, Plaintiff seeks to enforce a promise in the insurance policy to pay interest on a delayed payment for homeowners insurance coverage. Plaintiff suffered a loss in January 2020 and filed a notice of claim on January 20th, 2020. Plaintiff did not receive full payment on her claim until June 8, 2021, one and a half years later. The payment did not include interest as required by the policy and a Florida statute. Plaintiff sued State Farm for failure to pay interest as promised in the policy. And the key policy language is at uh, page four of the reply brief and, and in the record at 705 and 706. And the policy language says, and I'm gonna read it and it's a little long and then I'll, I'll kind of shorten it with my own ellipse. Um, if we do not pay or deny a loss within 90 days after we receive notice of an initial reopened or supplemental property insurance claim from you, and no factors beyond our control would reasonably prevent us from making payment, interest will be paid in accordance with section 627-70131, subsection five. Talk okay. about that, what does that mean, in accordance with? In accordance means- Without citing to a dictionary, what do the cases say? Uh, consistent, the, the, no case, there's been one Southern District Court case that has analyzed this policy provision. And that's, a, that's not a state court case. State Farm is the only insurer that has this policy provision. And what State Farm is trying to do is deny plaintiff a reasonable interpretation of the policy. There could be varying uh, answers to your question, Your Honor, but one reasonable answer means that if payment is required under that statute, payment is also required under the promise in the policy. That is one reasonable interpretation. Appley may argue there's another reasonable interpretation that this policy language interpreted the entire entirety of the statute and payment in accordance means we also get a limitation of liability or a limitation against enforcement. So giving them the benefit of the doubt, Your Honor, Plaintiff has a reasonable, appellant has a reasonable interpretation, and Florida law is clear that when there are competing reasonable interpretations, the insured must win. Uh, and we don't jump directly to ambiguity, though, do we? Uh, no, Your Honor. You I, in other words, we need to deploy time-tested, long-honored tools of um, interpretation to determine things before and only if there's more than one reasonable interpretation then do we go to do do we go to cardinal rules like ambiguity and the like right absolutely are right. you conceding are you suggesting this is amb ambiguous in uh, accordance with no your honor we believe uh, appellant believes it's not ambiguous at all that in accordance clearly means that if you got to pay it under the statute you got to pay it under the policy but giving the benefit of the doubt to the appellee here giving them the benefit, you cannot ignore respectfully the reasonable interpretation of plaintiff, which we believe is not ambiguous, giving the reasonable benefit of the doubt that there could be ambiguity 
that's got to cut in front of the plaintiff. And then what's also important here, Judge, is what we're trying to apply and what State Farm is trying to apply is a limitation on coverage. Plaintiff says um, you got to pay it with, with in accordance with the statute. State Farm says, well, there's a limitation on enforcement. Under Florida law, for a court to apply a limitation, it must be, the limitation must be stated unambiguously and clearly in the policy. There's no notice to plaintiff on this policy that, that she can't uh, seek enforcement of that promise. Payment in accordance means we'll pay you like it says you pay you. Now, one thing that's important also about the statute, Judge, is as we sit here on appeal, there is no issue before this court on whether State Farm was, is, is required by Florida law to pay the interest. This is not some getcha. This is not some, oh, we're trying to find a loophole to make State Farm do something that State Farm is not already required to do. The Florida legislature spoke on this issue. The Florida legislature said in situations like this, all insurers must pay statutory interest. Now, that's a requirement, it's enforceable. It's not enforceable by a private plaintiff under that statute if the private plaintiff only seeks interest. But it is enforceable, and it is a legal requirement. This is not um, some, some getcha on State Farm. Now, here's the thing. State Farm's the only insurer that made the same promise in its policy. And that's why all of these cases cited by um, State Farm don't apply. It's, it's apples to oranges. We've got a promise to pay in accordance. Well, um, I, I wouldn't say in all the cases. Bar, Barbado, Barbado, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, involved State Farm, did it not? And it looks like it involved the same policy, which incorporated it by explicit reference to the statute. So I take it then that you would acknowledge that at least that case is on all fours with this one and would be asking that we uh, cut the other direction. Absolutely, right? Your Honor. And I mentioned the Southern District Court case earlier. I didn't mean to. I was... Uh, I misspoke. Uh, these other cases don't involve State Farm. The Southern District case involves State Farm. The Southern District Court did not address and wrestle with these very important key issues. It's enforcement of policy language. It's giving the benefit of a reasonable interpretation to an insured. The requirement that State Farm's required to pay this stuff anyway. Um, and the requirement that limitations against coverage must be clearly and expressly provided. And so in our reply brief, we, we just come out and say it. The Southern District Federal Court got it wrong. And I've got no other explanation other than that. And I do ask this court to cut against it. So if you were to um, zero in on a particular part of the Barbado, Barbado Court's analysis, uh, where you think that uh, things went off the rails, where, where would that be? Um, how, how would you... Uh, you know, walk us through sort of the decision tree of, of where the misstep was. Well, the misstep was, was, was not applying the rules of construction, um, determining whether the plaintiff had a reasonable interpretation. Uh, if the plaintiff, well, determining if there's ambiguity, Judge, of course, first, which we believe payment in accordance does not mean payment in accordance but no private right of action, okay? So that's not ambiguous. The court should have looked at that. Okay, um, why didn't State Farm say, well, pay in, why didn't State Farm just say, we incorporate the statute in its entirety? Because that's not what State Farm was doing. State Farm was promising that they would pay in a manner that is already required by, by Florida law. The court in, um, in, in Barbado ignored the rules of construction. And then what we've also got is we've got this statute, um, Your Honor, that, that also was ignored which is 627-41H, which basically codifies this. If the policy provides more coverage provided in a statute, it stands. And that's what we have here. We have a promise to pay with no limitation. Um, freedom of contract is another thing I haven't spoken of. Parties have a right to freedom of contract. State Farm's got a right to freedom of contract. Plaintiff's got a right to freedom of contract. 
I'd like to talk about the 60-day appraisal. So as a backup argument, State Farm says, look, we paid consistent with our 60-day appraisal. We therefore don't owe pursuant to the promise to pay in accordance with the statute. So the 60 days is born of the contract, not the statute, right? Uh, yes, Your Honor. In other words, the, the statute 627, and I'm referring to page 706 of the record in the contract, say, it, it, it talks about will be paid in accordance with section 627-70131, subsection 5. Um, I, a couple of questions, if I may. We've spent some time on in accordance with, but is the fact that an appraisal was elected, that there was a disagreement as to the amount due and owing that ultimately had to be presented for appraisal, is that a factor beyond State Farm's control? Um, I don't believe so, Your Honor, but for purposes of the case, I believe that it is beyond. It, it's No, Your Honor. For, for purposes of this appeal, Factors beyond State Farm's control were eliminated fifth, uh, when the appraisal order was, was made. Now, it's an individualized question. We haven't been entitled to discovery in this case yet. And so to answer your question, we need to do some discovery. And this is a motion to dismiss. So I can't, without getting in there and seeing their defenses on, on, on factors in control, I can't get there. But I do know once that appraisal order was entered, there were no more factors. Okay? And that's a legal question that's not before this court. It's a legal question that, that hasn't been decided in Florida, but I believe it's a strong legal opinion. Well, we're called upon to understand the contract and the time frames within the contract. And you have one timeline when it relates to appraisal and things of that sort, 60 days. And I think payment was tendered 32 days, if I recall the record, something around there, around 32 month. days after appraisal. Right, Your Honor. So you have the timeline within the born exclusively of the contract, and then you have the timeline in the statute, Chapter 627, that is brought into the contract uh, expressly, right, the 90 days, right? Well, Your Honor, it's in both, it's in both the policy and the statute. Correct. That, that's, that's, that, in other words, you have brought the statutory language into this contract and you have a as i think you've argued if i heard you correctly you have a cause of action independent of the statute you have a cause of action for the breach of the contract and the express promise within the breach is that right or within the contract is that right yes your honor okay so is there what do you make or how should we look at the timeline of 90 days within the statute and within the contract when there's no factor outside of State Farm's control that would allow payment, that would permit payment, as to the 60 days when an appraisal is needed. Okay, Your Honor, first of all, you first look and see if there's a conflict. And there's no conflict. They pay as required under the appraisal, and if it's more than 50 day, 15 days after factors beyond control are eliminated, you got to include interest. The only way you, you choose one policy provision over another is if there's a conflict. And so here, and, and this is another thing that's, that's important. The, the appraisal requirement, and if you look at the record 705 and 706, the payment in accordance with is in the same section. It's right below it. They're concurrent obligations. There's no either or. There's no if and but. They both are there, and they both tell us when payments need to be pay, made, right? And if a payment is, they're not incorporating the, the statute here on this, if payment is made, uh, is not made within 90 days after you receive notice, on and on and on. So we're seeking to enforce the policy here, and the policy provides only a requirement that State Farm already, this already is, really, is required really a to defense, pay. defense, right? Pardon me, this sir? This is really State Farm's defense, is that we paid. What, what did the plaintiff allege in, in the complaint? Because that's what the judge should be looking at, right? You don't get to come in in a motion to dismiss and present your defenses. Um, Your Honor, the, the complaint alleged that State Farm paid but did not include the interest required under the policy. And so that's it. And State Farm says, look, the limitation against enforcement is incorporated into the policy. And under Florida Rules of Construction, we believe that that's wrong. And we believe the that dismissal of the complaint based on the State Farm's position that they paid timely. The dismissal of the complaint was, I believe, Your Honor, based on the decision to construe the statute broadly and in, in paragraph three of the order, uh, construe the statute broadly so as to incorporate the limitation against private right of action. And so that's the defense. Now, you're right, Judge, if there's no, if there's no duty to pay interest, 
if there's no duty to pay interest and that policy provision we're seeking to enforce doesn't apply then state farm did pay but state farm didn't pay the interest as required under the policy and importantly because i know there's a lot of stuff up out there about worrying about homeowners insurance companies okay? the legislator already made this decision the legislator already decided that the insurance companies need to pay this and there's a year and a half delay and the policy is clear and must be read consistent with what we believe is a reasonable interpretation. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. <laughs> May it please the court, um, Nancy Copperthwaite on behalf of Appellee State Farm Florida. Um, your Honors, this is a case that has been before numerous federal and Florida judges. Not a single one of them have found um, the position that Ms. Taylor is arguing here. Counsel, how many cases involved an insurance contract that recited uh, a promise to pay interest in accordance with the statute? Um, the Barbado case. Did Honor. any of the other cases involve and such a provision? I'm sorry. Did any of the other cases involve such a, uh, an insurance contract? I, I, I'm not aware. It's not entirely clear from the decisions, Your Honor. There is the fourth district case, which is also a state farm case, the Silver case. Um, then there are the two federal cases, Williams and Riley. But those involve claims about an implied uh, incorporation of the statute, well, not an express incorporation. They, they right? are breach of contract claims. True, here, true. Here but the actual it. contract, the underlying contract, there was no claim in those cases that the contract involved language that expressly incorporated the statute. No, Is that right? No, Is that fair? but okay. the courts deal with it as breach of contract claims, assuming that it's um, part of the policy, which, because again, they're all on motions to dismiss, so they have to assume that that that's what the plaintiff alleged, and they're assuming that for purposes of the motion to dismiss. Okay, so just to, to um, make sure that I understand your position, it sounds like your position is that regardless whether the contract expressed the incorporated statute, that's, that's not important. The relevant, uh, you know, uh, sort of well, point I, on the analysis is that if there's a, an asserted breach of contract claim, whether it incorporates the statute expressly or merely implicitly, that doesn't matter. It's uh, the same type of claim, and it's barred by the statute on your reading of the statute. Is that fair? Correct, Your Honor, but my, my first point, if I can back up for a minute, is that I believe the reason why interest is not even a relevant factor here is because State Farm paid according to its policy obligation. Did and it pay according to the statute? Did, yes, yes. Okay. Um, but they pay, the policy obligation is 60 days after an appraisal. The statutory obligation talks about, that they refer to, talks about 90 days or factors beyond it. Now this is a motion to dismiss, so we did not get into the whole history, for example, the fact whether there was a lost payment, and in, it's certainly our view that appraisal, once appraisal uh, happens, then you are definitely beyond factors beyond the control. And in fact, this court has held in some cases that in fact, even an appraisal award, there can be factors beyond the insurer's control because there may still be some underlying coverage issues. And that's the case that we cite the uh, Hawkinder, I believe is the name case. Um, follow up on what Judge Pratt was asking you. State Farm didn't have to include this language in its policy, right? No, it did not. Other insurance companies don't, apparently. The, the, the decision no. to include it has to mean something. Why would we treat it the same as if it wasn't even in there? Well, the statute still applies to every insurer, Your Honor. Well, can the parties make the provision of the statute more beneficial to the insured? Can they change they 30 days? No, Why no. Not? But... Why, can't the, why, why couldn't they do that? Say but the State Farm will pay within 30 days. But an insurer can, as Ms. Taylor argued, um, can make promises to go beyond what's a statutory obligation. But in this case, there's no 
indication that state farm is going beyond what the statute says state farm specifically says if and they talk about ninety days not fifteen days ninety days if after ninety days they haven't done something with this claim then they will and there are no factors beyond its control which is not relevant here because there were factors beyond its control in other words if they just if they got a proof of loss immediately <clears throat> and they just did nothing with the claim then they would pay interest in accordance with the statute and state farm have said in the policy we understand the statute says failure to comply does not form a sole basis for private cause of action but we're not going to enforce that and in our policy you can sue us even if that's the only cause of well action. your honor that's an interesting question because that's exactly what judge moore said in barbado um i do this court certainly does not need to go that far um but judge moore said that because it is so clear um, and particularly what Judge Moore was focusing on was the language where um, the statute says the provisions of this subsection may not be waived, voided, or nullified. But it doesn't by say modified. It doesn't say it can't be modified. It says you can't void it or waive it. But Waived, voided, or nullified by the terms of the insurance policy. But, but you're suggesting, I'm, we're talking now about the last sentence. We're talking about the failure to comply, right? That's what you were asking about? Well, yes. Yes. So he said that because this failure to comply cannot be waived, voided, or nullified, that even if an insurance company said that you could, um, you could, could bring a private cause of action, you in fact couldn't because that would be contrary to Florida law. Now again, this is a private cause of action solely for interest. What happened in this case here is Ms. Taylor sued for um, her claim. The parties agreed to go to appraisal. She had a claim for interest. She got the appraisal award. She waited to get the check. She cashed the check. Then she files a new amended complaint. That amended complaint is solely for interest. So I want to back up and, and follow up on Judge Harris's <clears throat> line of questions. Imagine uh, an insurance contract that states, uh, you know, we will pay interest, and it doesn't even reference the statute at all, but it says we will pay interest, and then it sets out what are essentially the terms in the statute. And then it says that this is an essential um, you know, uh, and material portion of the policy, and we explicitly confer a right of suit uh, in the event that we breach this provision of the contract. Would that make a difference for you, or do you think that that likewise would be um, uh, in conflict with the statutory scheme? I, I don't know, Your Honor. I think that, you know, that's certainly not the situation we have here, and it's unclear whether um, a court would find that that, in fact, violated the statute. Insurers can make promises to provide coverage other than what's required by the law. Um, so perhaps in that case they could, but in, that's certainly not where we are. And in fact, even Judge Moore, although he found that an insurer could not at all waive the private right of action, um, he did not go so far. He did not say that State Farm's policy did so. He just, he just was, it was essentially dicta, what he said. And of course, um, because that's not part of the policy here, there's no need for this court to address it. Yeah, I think it's just, it's just interesting. Um, I mean, the statute the statute also does not mention the word appraisal, and I think it's very important that the court focus on the fact that there are numerous Florida cases, including the Silber case, which was an appraisal case, which was also involving the statutory interest claim, um, that specifically say time and time again, where an insurer, as State Farm in this case, does not deny coverage and the parties go to appraisal, there is no interest due if the appraisal award is tendered within the policy terms. 
and the court say we look to the policy to determine when payment is due and when and whether interest is due and i filed a notice of supplemental on two recent third dca cases involving the same issue and as the silver case which is from the fourth dca was state farm and was a claim for both pre-judgment interest and statutory interest under this statute so just to make sure that we understand your argument um it sounds like from what you said earlier that in your view it should not make a difference in the analysis whether the insurance contract expressly incorporates uh you know a promise to pay pre-judgment interest or not is that fair or accurate right that the analysis doesn't turn on whether the insurance contract contains language regarding pre-judgment interest if it if it merely says as state farm says it would be in accordance with the statute if if it said something beyond that then i agree that there would be an open issue okay so it's this in accordance with language that would take this outside of uh my hypothetical that i posed to you it sounds correct okay correct um now the statute itself though uh provides that violation of the statute does not constitute an independent cause of action but i you also would concede that a breach of contract action is a cause of action separate and distinct from a cause of action for breach of the statute you would just construe this claim to be really a claim for breach of the statute rather than breach of the contract well yes not exactly i mean as barbado and um riley and williams all analyze that essentially the duty is the statutory duty and the legislature has made a determination um that there cannot be an independent cause of action for that particular interest claim alone it does not mean that there cannot be a claim for interest coupled with a damages claim and in fact miss taylor had that but then she went to appraisal and then only after the appraisal was paid did she say that she wanted to try to bring a class action purely for interest the statute really says you can't sue there's no private cause of action for the breach of the statute alone no independent cause of action correct so all those insurance policies that don't have this language in there you can't sue for interest based solely on the statute correct but why doesn't it make a difference that state farm puts this in the policy why isn't that enforceable on a contractual basis because you can't incorporate and say you're going to pay in accordance with the pop with the statute without incorporating also the um term the last sentence and in fact the statute itself says that the provisions cannot be waived voided or nullified by the terms of an insurance policy meaning what's i i think following up on judge harris's question what is waived voided or modified if an insurance contract says we are independently as a matter of contract giving you a right to this pre-judgment interest of course the statute says that you don't have a standalone cause of action under the statute but it's not purporting to waive void or modify that provision of the statute because it's saying as a matter of contract we give you this right right that's a standalone cause of action right but it's only saying we'll pay in accordance with the terms of the statute and also state farm did pay in accordance with the statute so the state farm's policy says that it will pay appraisal awards within 60 days just like all the numerous cases that we cited including the silver case the silver case quotes the state farm language that says they will pay appraisal awards within 60 days and in silver they found that by paying the appraisal award within 60 days state farm satisfied its obligation and did not owe interest and also i would note that there is no um there is no allegation here that there were um factors beyond state farms control that prevented a payment uh that there were not 
factors, that's, that, that factors did not exist beyond state farms control to prevent a payment within 90 days. The 90 day time limitation, which is what is in state farms policy, is not even alleged by the plaintiff. What they're trying to do is they're trying to create and engraft a 15 day post appraisal um, provision into the policy, which does not exist in the policy. Isn't it a reasonable interpretation of the policy language that says interest will be paid in accordance with the statute simply to mean interest will be paid at the rate set forth in 55.03, interest will accrue from the date the insurer received notice? Isn't that paying in accordance with the statute? Tells you how to pay it and when to pay it, how much to pay? If, if an obligation were due, that would be, but this, um, in Florida, there is no reasonable expectation doctrine. In Florida, you look at the plain language of the policy, and that's what's enforced. Um, opposing counsel keeps talking about reasonable interpretations, and you don't, that may be uh, a policy that courts apply in Georgia, but in Florida, it's, and we have a, a case in our notice of supplemental also talk from the Florida Supreme Court discussing that in Florida there is no reasonable expectation and that's not how you construe a policy. You have to look at the plain language of the policy. And here the plain language is very clear. There is a provision if there's an agreement you have 20 days. But the days. plain language is payment will be made in accordance with the statute payment will be made. Nothing in the policy talks about the cause of action. It says we will pay in accordance with the statute. It says if we do not pay or deny a loss within 90 days after notice and no factors beyond our control would prevent payment, interest will be paid. Right, so it's payment that is in accordance with the statute. But, but. Isn't that the plain language? Only if it? we do not pay or deny a loss within 90 days and if there are no factors beyond our control. What happens in accordance with the statute? The payment, right? I interest would be paid. Correct. Right, so payment is in accordance with the statute. That's the plain language of the policy. Correct. Nothing about a cause of action. No, but they're incorporating, as the courts, as Judge Moore found in Barbado, this is incorporating, if you're relying on the statute here, then you have to incorporate the entire statute, including the prohibition on a private cause of action for interest, because the statute also talks about how you cannot nullify, waive um, the, that obligation in a policy. It but says, the policy say, if we have to pay interest, we'll pay it at twice the rate set forth in 5503. I don't know. Well, first of all, again, Your Honor, we're not there, but according to what Judge- My point, we, they could modify it without nullifying it, voiding it, or waiving it. They could modify the terms. We're but, gonna pay twice the interest. But you're talking about modifying a rate or an amount of interest, and what we're talking about here is the prohibition. It's a legislative prohibition on having a private cause of action solely for interest. The Florida legislature said we do not want lawsuits just for interest. They made that decision for whatever reason they made it, and that comes with the statute. So an attempt to just sue for interest alone is the problem here. Also, the, the problem is that State Farm did pay in accordance to its policy terms, and you don't even get to an interest issue unless State Farm paid too late. If State Farm paid on time, how can there be interest due? And we've cited 10 cases 
talking about similar situations with an appraisal award. An appraisal award is viewed as taking the matter um, outside the control because if you don't have your appraisal yet, how do you know what to pay? In this case, as soon as there was an appraisal award, in just about a month, State Farm paid. There's no dispute that State Farm paid, that the plaintiffs got, uh, that Ms. Taylor got the entire amount due, and that State Farm therefore fulfilled its contractual obligation to the plaintiff. And if the court has no other questions, I would just um, ask the court to affirm the dismissal of the class action complaint. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. All right, Mr. Hall, just under six minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, addressing the last point um, the council made, all of these cases about statutory interest and appraisals, none of those, those all dealt with the statutory prejudgment interest requirements. They didn't address a promise to pay in compliance with the statute here. There hadn't been a case on that. So none of those cases apply. As far as the federal court's Barbado decision, relying on the requirement that the statutory provisions can't be waived, voided, or nullified, they can be expanded. That's an expansion that's not a waiver or avoiding or a nullify, and that's provided in Florida Statute 627.418 that the last sentence says, if the insurer issues or delivers or policies for an amount which exceeds any limitations otherwise provided in this code, then it goes on to say the insurer has to pay for it. Now, I don't have the case for you on this, but we do know that if it's against public policy, then that may not be true, but this isn't against public policy, okay? Because the legislator has already says it's a good thing to pay this stuff. And this is just a payment that is a promise to the insured to pay in accordance. Of course, the legislature has also provided that it's not, uh, you know, a statutory cause of action. There has to be some other private right of action. And, you know, one of the things that, that I'm wrestling with, frankly, is, you know, how, how can we distinguish between an insurance contract on the one hand, which has expressed language regarding the payment of interest, and then one on the other hand, which doesn't, but then, of course, we have, you know, background Florida law, statutory law, that says that these insurance contracts incorporate, right, Florida statutory law within them. And, of course, you've seen all of the cases that argue, even when the contract didn't provide, you know, a promise to pay interest, that, you know, they're bootstrapping their way to a promise, and then framing their claim as a breach of contract action rather than a breach of the statute. Um, and of course, you know, we've seen courts reject that, right, and say that that would basically, you know, render without effect the, you know, subsection uh, 5, the last sentence that says that, you know, that it's not a ind independent or that it's not a statutory cause of action. So walk us through how we can distinguish your case, which, of course, conceitedly incorporates language into the contract, from the other claims which you know, rely on well-founded Florida law to say that these insurance contracts incorporate a promise by implication. Um, yes, Your Honor, thank you. So, um, like the Foundation Health and other cases say, yeah, the, the statutory statutes can be incorporated as a matter of law. This isn't incorporating as a matter of law. This is an express promise to pay in accordance with the terms of that statutory provision. So we don't need to incorporate the statute. And all that's incorporated is when you pay and when you don't pay. And that is, and why is that all that's incorporated? Because that's a reasonable interpretation of pay in accordance with. Now this reasonable interpretation stuff is Florida law. It's the auto owner's case. And it basically says if there's two reasonable opinions, then it is by definition ambiguous. And the insurers, the insureds claim um, must, uh, must, must hold. Did I, did I answer your, am I missing something? I'm just you? trying to see how, um, if you were, you know, to ask us to write a decision to reverse, which you are, um, how uh, a decision could be written that uh, would, 
cabin this case from other cases in which there's no express contract language but it's you know well established florida law that you know insurance contracts incorporate you know the relevant statutory law um and you saw all of the you know the barbado case had this express language but the other federal cases didn't right right and uh you know um so judge the opinion the language that i would use would be that the insurance policy um, provides a promise to pay in accordance and does not expressly include a limitation to enforcement florida rules of contract construction require that any limitation uh, or exclusion of coverage must be provided and set out in the policy unambiguously and state farm did not do that here plaintiff reasonably reads the policy as requiring actual payment with no limitation on enforcement and as such under florida supreme court law the plaintiff's policy um, the, the plaintiff's reading of the policy should control um, and, and that's one thing that if you look at the answer brief and, and respectfully argument here is there's a lot of um, using a general conclusory we've got to incorporate the statute but very little on rules of construction um, and, 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 and then the overriding thing on fairness here state farms required to pay this stuff okay this is not some gotcha by plaintiff the legislature decided state farm has to pay it now plaintiff can't do that with the statute but state farm decided to to make to to make that distinct promise and because of that plaintiff is entitled to enforce the contract no other questions your honor thank you for your your time and patience all right thank you counsel